Hello everyone, and welcome to Mr. This is Western Asia, and here is Azerbaijan. Now let's dig in, shall we? No one knows exactly who the most ancient Paleolithic peoples of Azerbaijan were, but this was where some of them lived, the Azokh Cave, where someone's jaw, stone tools, and hunted animal bones were found. Skipping ahead to the 9th and 8th centuries BC, we see Azerbaijan home to two interesting peoples, the Caucasian Albanians and the Scythians. The Albanians, no relation to the ones of Europe, lived in the northeast. They later would become, like Armenia, an independent state and amid mighty empires, with a capital at Kabbalah. Then there were the Scythians, a nomadic Iranian people who were mighty warriors and peerless horsemen who would end up ruling an immense slice of the world. As for Azerbaijan, it later came under the rule of another Iranian people, the Medes. Then another Iranian people, the Persians, having the honor of being personally invaded by Cyrus himself. Persian culture would leave a permanent stamp on Azerbaijan. As for the country's name, well, the Persians ruled their giant empire by dividing it up into a patchwork of provinces called satrapies, ruled over by satrapies or governors, sort of like a lot of local governments under a main federal one. The satrapy Atropateni, named for the ruler Atorpat, would give its name to Azerbaijan. Atorpat actually became buddies with Alexander the Great after he conquered Persia. So time passed and Azerbaijan came under the rule of another Iranian people, the Parthians, famous for their long rivalry with Rome. Christianity became the official religion of Caucasian Albania, and Iranian rule in the south continued with the Sasanians. Then in the 7th century, the Arabs invaded, bringing Islam, and ruled for several centuries with their various caliphates. Then another Iranian dynasty ruled them. Then another. The Rus invaded, took some loot. Then the ten hundreds saw Turkic tribes invade from Central Asia. The Turks were not simply looking for some quick cash. They planned to stay. And they did. And to this day, the language of Azerbaijan is a Turkish one. Now, the rough and rugged Turkic conquerors did not have much of a culture themselves. So they adopted Persian customs and promoted Persian art, architecture, literature, and so on. Some of the greatest poets in the Persian language were from Azerbaijan, such as Kakani and Nizami Ganjavi. The 1200s saw the Mongols invade, slaughter, pillage, and destroy whole cities. The region soon fell under the rule of Ogode Khan, son of Genghis Khan. So horrific was the damage, some regions like Shirvan took a hundred years to recover. The rulers of Shirvan, the Shirvanshas, did their best to keep the land intact and functioning as invaders poured in to tear it down. And when given the chance, really built some beautiful buildings, like this palace in Baku. Poor Azerbaijan was then invaded by the Turkic Mongol conqueror Tamerlane, who made a horrible mess. Then the Safavid Persians invaded and took over. The Sunni Muslims were forced to become Shia Muslims. And when they objected, the Persians sat down with them and had a polite talk over a cup of tea. No, just kidding, they killed them. Wars continued. The early 1700s saw Ottoman and Russian invasions. And while leaders like Nadir Shah and Aga Muhammad reinforced Persian rule in the region, the Persian grip was slipping and Russia was too strong to stop. After two wars, Imperial Russia gained the Caucasus and Azerbaijan. Russian rule brought many challenges and grievances, but Azerbaijan's economy went way up with Russians taking charge of trade and, most most importantly, oil. Industrialization skyrocketed in the latter 19th century, after the government's monopoly on oil was abolished and the public was free to get a piece of the oily pie. Baku's population grew from 14,000 to 200,000, and trade went quicker once railways were built in the 1880s. Baku became multicultural and divided and angry. Russians were in charge, Armenians were the administrators, Muslims the disgruntled laborers, and foreigners were everywhere. Azeris felt the Russians gave preferential treatment to Armenians, and after economic depression hit, they started killing each other, leaving thousands dead. Calls for Azerbaijan's independence grew louder after the Tsar was overthrown by the communists in Russia, and the fragile stability of the country snapped like a dry twig. The Baku Armenians had been freaking out over the news of Armenians being slaughtered next door in the Ottoman Empire, and now that the Russians weren't here to protect them, and there was chaos, riots, and Bolsheviks, they lashed out in fear and rage, and thousands of Azeris were killed in the March days. A few months later, the Ottoman Islamic Army of the Caucasus entered Baku and killed the Armenians anyway. Azerbaijan was declared a country that same year, but in 1920, the Russians returned and retook took the land, leaving thousands of Azeris dead. Azerbaijan became a part of the Soviet Union, and hell returned in the 1930s with the Great Purge under Joseph Stalin, when untold numbers of suspected enemies of the state were gotten rid of, including this Azeri poet, executed in 1938. But Stalin most likely never could have stopped Hitler without Azerbaijan, as the bulk of Soviet oil came from Azerbaijan, not to mention the 400,000 Azeris who died fighting for the Soviets in World War II. Economic hardship came in the 1960s when Soviet oil industries moved elsewhere, conflict with Armenians resumed, especially over the region Nagorno-Karabakh, which was and is majority Armenian, which occurred soon after Azerbaijan's independence in 1991. Things started improving under Haydar Aliyev's presidency, but corruption was rife, and that's saying a lot as nothing is naturally as corrupt as politics. He's 
son, Ilham Aliyev, took power after him. In 2009, the constitution was changed to get rid of term limits and end freedom of the press. So basically now he could rule as long as he wanted and there was nothing you could say about it. Have Azeris protested this dictator? Yes, and now they're in prison. We weren't told this when Azerbaijan hosted Eurovision. So this was the sad story of Azerbaijan, which really has made immense improvements and advancements. But beneath the glitter of its sparkling capital simmer serious problems. We hope for good things for Azeris in the future and for their beautiful country to receive leaders who are worthy of it. But for now, bye-bye.